you will read in textbooks that despite several conflicts, wars, and occupations, China is one of the few countries in the world that managed to avoid European colonization. This is wrong. While the state indeed barely survived the high tide of colonialism and imperialism, the Europeans were engaged in a veritable scramble for China that managed to carve out of the Middle Kingdom not just the well-known colonies such as Hong Kong, Qingdao, and Port Arthur, but also a swathe of areas, ports, cities, railroads, and even a mountain resort where sovereignty was not clearly defined. Colonial architecture still reminds modern inhabitants of this discreet empire building, and the events of the scramble have fueled frictions, suspicions, and racism between China, Japan, and the West since. It was all started by the Portuguese settlement in Macau, then continued by the British Empire and the East India Company, with the treaty that ended the First Opium War in 1842, in which Britain gained the first real European colony on Chinese soil, that is, Hong Kong but also the right to trade in a series of ports known as the Treaty Ports, and to establish permanent settlements there. The British and the Portuguese were joined by the United States and France in carving out their own sphere of influence and living space in China. Most remained confined to the river or seaside waterfronts, known as the Buns, where they could set up warehouses and churches. But some settlers, men of enterprise, adventure, or faith as they were, pushed further and further beyond the official boundaries, often without permission or approval from their own governments, which, however, felt obliged to back them up with their firepower, their gunboats, should they get into trouble. It was a precarious and contradictory existence. The presence of European commerce greatly benefited local merchants and officials, but these settlements were clearly infringements of sovereignty. European missionaries would look for converts to their strange and puzzling religion, attracting as much attention from the spiritually curious as from opportunists, looking for foreign protection in their own local disputes. Xenophobic rumors about kidnappings, organ harvesting, and all sorts of devilry spread among local populations, even as most Chinese had never seen a foreigner in their lives. And sometimes officials felt obliged to act, risking diplomatic incidents, even as they knew that the rumors were mostly nonsense. In the settlements, too, the European facade of self confidence and racial superiority was betrayed by an almost industrial production of newspaper articles, essays, and novels depicting characters of the Chinese, calling for ever greater European involvement in the country and protection for their communities, especially as the Qing Empire started embarking on modernizing reforms, which provoked the first instances of fright uh, for the so called Yellow Peril. The Europeans and their settlements had legitimate reasons to worry. They were massively outnumbered by the natives, and the multiple wars fought by the foreign powers in China and the inter-Chinese civil wars and rebellions put them and their beloved property at near constant risk. As the century was nearing conclusion, the scramble for the partition of the world intensified and China was no different. The British and the French were joined by the resurgent Japanese Empire and Russia. The US became ever more involved, even uh, powers such as Italy and even powers such as tiny as Belgium became involved. The concessions started to house ever larger foreign and Chinese populations, as industry and service to the establishment gave employment opportunities to Chinese and Europeans of lower and middle classes. Society was, however, segregated. Despite the concessions mostly remaining Chinese territory by law, the Yure, Chinese, much like dogs, were not allowed in public parks and respectable shops and inns. The microcosm of the secret multinational empire was the Shanghai International Settlement. While technically Chinese territory, it housed at Xpeak over a million Chinese residents and tens of thousands of foreigners governed by Westerners. The vast majority of them, surprisingly, were Japanese and not Europeans by the 1930s. The Japanese nonetheless never quite achieved equal status in the eyes of the Anglo-American dominated authority, the Municipal Council, which was a de facto government that provided public services ranging from plumbing and fire brigade to an army called the Volunteer Corps. Even as their nations descended into ever greater tensions and hostilities, the foreign community always had the interest to be united to protect this unique product of colonialism against the Chinese. 
only the historic events of the fall of the Qing Empire, the Great War, and the resurgence of Chinese nationalism truly heralded the beginning of the end for their world. Welcome back everyone to another nice little Kaiserreich quote-unquote lore video or whatever. Uh, although this one is pretty relating to, well, real-life China during this period as well, so take that as you may. Anyway, it's still Legation Cities as you can see obviously by the name. Now, uh, the Legation Cities are a weird thing. Very weird thing. Uh, so basically, uh, what does this mean? Uh, I think approximate a little more than half of my view mm, something around half of my viewers are not native English speakers so a legation is actually a um, generally a diplomatic building now these places are called the legation cities and obviously in Kaiserreich they hold a bunch of cities on the coast of China as you probably are aware of uh, it's called the legation cities because the legation in China also generally expanded its meaning to mean not only the diplomatic building itself, um, which at the beginning were legations because the Chinese did not really accept the whole concept of foreign ambassadors. It was kind of weird. It's a discussion that takes forever. Um, be and then these legations evolved generally into legation quarters so uh, the most famous one being in Beijing for example and later as uh, mentioned in the introduction when essentially the Western powers in Japan and well uh, the US which we're gonna collectively refer to as the Western powers from now on started to actually carve up China for themselves um, one of the things that they started to take were concessions, which were basically areas where in a single city, uh, just a chunk of that city would be, you know, their territory. Uh, and there they would build their, you know, buildings, legations included. So obviously the most famous one was in Beijing. Uh, most famous one because uh, this, this one was built essentially after the second... Um, opium war when the British finally got the right recognized to actually like have permanent diplomatic establishment in Beijing and later on the other foreign powers such as for example Russia which actually already had a uh, presence in Beijing but that's another that's another story and France and later Japan and the United States and Italy or whatever uh, Germany they all built their shit there, and so it was it was named the Legation Quarter within Beijing. So that's the origin of the term. And essentially, it's the this uh, quote unquote country, uh, uh, this uh, entity is the collection of all these concessions. Now, it's kind of idealized on the map because on the map it controls well Hong Kong, obviously because there's no Great Britain, so Hong Kong, you know, just. Uh, from a real colony, it kind of got added to that. There's Shanto or Swato, uh, want to use the pronunciation. There's Fuzhou, then there's Ningbo, there's Shanghai, and a few other neighboring boroughs of Shanghai, and uh, Tianjin. But um, there were actually a lot more concessions than this one. You may have noticed the map in the intro video. There were a lot of flags in that map almost everywhere. That is because not only treaty ports, which was, were essentially ports that... Uh, in which, like, foreign merchants were allowed to trade, which wasn't really, like, a normal thing for the Chinese Empire, were given to foreign powers. Not, so not only, like, the rights of trade in a place, but also uh, concessions. So that's what we, you know, see of, like, for example, a part of Beijing is just officially not, you know, uh, not part of China anymore. That's part of France, like Great Britain, or whatever. Tianjin was especially famous for having a lot of concessions, you know, it's called the, the Tianjin Concessions. And in fact, even like Italy and Belgium had a concession in Tianjin it's because basically everyone had one. So that was sort of the second tier, uh, and that, uh, the concessions were in a ton of cities, like for example Nanjing had concessions, and even Wuhan, or Wuhan had concessions, and a few others scattered all about the place. Um, 
So the European Empire in China was sort of all over the place, and if we, if we just look at treaty ports, so places when where essentially the foreigners could have a presence that could then turn into, you know, officially recognized sovereignty, like a square mile of foreign sovereignty just right in the middle of China, it go, like treaty ports went all the way to Chongqing. Um, and even like backwater places such as Nanyang and Wuzhou. Um, so that's that essentially. The foreign presence in China had uh, gotten to be very, very, uh, you could say stratified, but also very, very much uh, sort of with deep roots. Anyway, so that th those are the two main levels, but then there were like actual real colonies, and that those were obviously uh, Qingdao, that was Port Arthur, uh, that was Russian and Japanese, depending on the period. There was Wei Highway, which was a British, um, and then coming down here, there was obviously Taiwan, which is Japanese, but that's a whole other story. And then there was obviously Hong Kong and Macau, uh, and then Guangzhou Wan. So essentially, except for the places that are German controlled, in Kaiserreich, we have that um, all of the places uh, on the coastline, because again, it is very, very likely that the legation cities, like in the real, quote unquote, real Kaiserreich, you, like if Kaiserreich was actually real, the legation cities would like just own a random place, place uh, in Wuhan, like just a random piece of Wuhan, a random piece of Nanjing. There would be like a, a tiny place that's actually under the sovereignty of the legation cities. Um, and again, these are the places that are not obviously German controlled because the German Empire didn't fall apart. Now, all the other empires basically fell apart, and so, uh, especially the British one, which had the most territory in um, in China out of all the European empires, uh, so they all come together to form the legation cities to sort of protect themselves, and uh, I will spare you the uh, ridiculous Kaiserreich uh, 1920s China lore, but, you know... Um, you can probably understand that things weren't exactly the most stable, and so this arrangement has continued. Now, uh, as mentioned, the you know role model for all of this is the Shanghai International Settlement, which um, let's actually get a bit of a uh, bit of a view of that. Now, you're going like, what the fuck is going on? Uh, that is because the Shanghai International Settlement was pretty cool. Now. Uh, you can see I'm just doing this with OBS, so it's a big brain. Uh, now, essentially, if I... Oh, I need to make this a little bit... Let's fit the screen. There we go. Um, so, basically, this is the map of uh, Shanghai. This was, I believe, uh, an American map. Um, so essentially, as you can see, there's like a little uh, like orange outline, right? Uh, so that's the international settlement plus the like southwestern portion of that orange line. Uh, we can like go back to uh, we can go back to the zoomed version. The southwestern portion over here was a French settlement because the, the back then it was kind of weird because the French and the British were always sort of trying to rival each other for global dominance. And so um, the French mostly saw the quote unquote international settlement as a British settlement, which in all but name, it was a Anglo-American settlement, although it had Germans represented in the Municipal Council, which is the sort of legislative and executive organ. Um, it was mostly an, an Anglo-American venture. And these actually had borders, so this was actually a part of France, and this was in all effect an independent country, like right in the middle of Shanghai, just a random state, even though, quote-unquote, officially, it was Chinese territory. So, yeah, as you can see, it had a pretty big, and so this is the old Chinese city. This is what, how Shanghai looked like before the Europeans arrived and before the Opium War and before, you know, international trade, blah, 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 and then Shanghai blew up, you know, and, uh, yeah, essentially, it had this weird sort of semi-state. Now, um... As mentioned, the sort of um, main 
Oregon was the so-called municipal council. Now, in this, we have something called the legation council, which is, um, I define it as uh, the municipal council meets international relations, essentially, because is a body comprised of the representatives of the leading nations of interest in China. Motions here are proposed by a representative and must be gain a simple majority to pass. Abstentions do not count for either side, except in the case of a tie, where they serve as an extra vote for no. So you can see that all the countries that have sort of a stake in the international um, legations have, and you know, in fact, you can even get the Russian Republic back in, have voting rights. And uh, that is because like in real life, the municipal council, the way it worked is that um, essentially since it was just in the middle of a city, it was Shanghai, it was essentially um, like to, to gain an admission in it. Uh, to be like a voting member, you had to be a rate payer, uh, which is basically like, you know, you have to pay like a lot of taxes, essentially. Uh, so it was a landed uh, like census based uh, system for, you know, the people with the most essentially uh, construction land really had the most quote unquote political power. Uh, that is because, and of course, Chinese were excluded from this, even though there were people, there were like Chinese businessmen residing in Shanghai, the Chinese were excluded from this. So if you scale that up, you have that the uh, sort of international corporations and uh, the international gov the, the governments uh, of foreign countries that have a stake in the legation city uh, have a uh, seat on the legation council. So that is obviously the German Empire, the Empire of Japan, the Austrian Empire, the United States, and Flanders, Wallonia. This is actually kind of represented in the flag. This is just the flag of the international settlement. They didn't change it, which is kind of weird. Um, it's kind of difficult to see, actually. I wish it was... Actually, I can probably do some weird um, magic over here to make it a bit easier to see. Oh, God damn, this is pretty difficult. Uh, I mean, uh, so as you can see, there's like an American... Inside that uh, Shanghai International Settlement thing, there's an American flag, a Japanese flag, a Prussian flag, a Russian flag, a British flag, and a Austrian flag flag. Now, if you were to take the real one, uh, actually, yeah, it is modified because it's not a real one. If you were to take the real one, there would also be a Swedish and a Spanish uh, and a Portuguese flag. I don't know, it was weird stuff. Um, so yeah, that's basically about it. The other thing this is inspired by is like the way Hong Kong works. Uh, like basically the way Hong Kong's like legislative uh, apparatus works is that like the elections within Hong Kong are not only, um, are not just like random universal suffrage. No, you know, you have that, like there are different constituencies which are supposed to represent different interests within the city. So like you have, for example, a constituency of agriculture, a constituency of like finance, um, one of commerce, uh, one of shipping and all that kind of stuff. So all the different sectors of uh, the economy and the civil society. Uh, so, you know, there's like an academic one as well. And um, obviously, like, if you have the constituency of finance, you're not going to have like people voting it, you're gonna have corporations voting it. So that's a bit like the si how the city of London, uh, in the city of London in, in England, this weird uh, sort of legislative, uh, this weird legislative apparatus where corporations literally are people. Uh, in Hong Kong today, it's the same, but uh, actually about this time uh, in history, it wouldn't be the same because at this time in history, Hong Kong was just a fully British colony. And so basically it was, f it was, you know, Hong Kong was a, basically a dictatorship under the governor. Uh, there was already like the executive and the legislative council, but it didn't work in the same way as it does today. This arrangement uh, was a result of like the young reforms, which was basically like a plan to sort of quote unquote democratize Hong Kong and like the. 80s or something so you know uh it's it, it, this is vaguely inspired like this legislative arrangement is vaguely also inspired by that um but yeah it, it's not exactly the same so basically this whole thing is supposed to represent how essentially all nations are supposed to share a bit of a um bit of a uh part of the chinese pie now um 
The way international diplomacy worked in China for a long, long time was something called essentially um, most favored nation treatment uh, being handed out to countries. Now, most favored nation didn't mean shit because like basically all the countries that had a diplomatic presence in China had most favored nation after essentially all the uh, wars, all the foreign wars in China, which essentially meant that any privilege, any diplomatic privilege that the Chinese government would hand out to any single foreign country, for example, Great Britain, would then have to be given out to all the other countries with the most favored nation uh, status, which was supposed to um, was supposed to sort of quote unquote protect China because then you don't have that like oh uh, Great Britain like extracted a treaty to have these privileges or whatever so and they did it by like sending in the, the you know the gunboats or something uh bombarding somewhere oh then japan wants the same thing and so they also send in the gunboats of course this didn't work and they all always all sent in the gunboats anyway and they all sort of carved up china but that was the sort of thinking behind it and later on the americans had something called the open door policy which essentially um meant that their diplomacy towards China was supposed to ensure that uh, this um, sort of equi quote unquote equitable arrangement for all the powers was respected for China. Now, uh, obviously from a Chinese point of view, this very, very much looks like an international cartel of imperialist powers uh, sort of ganging up on China to extract, you know, uh, as much concessions from it as possible. And to a, you know, point, they were right. Um, of course, foreign powers did fight each other over China all the time. So I guessing that this sort of legations council is there supposedly to avoid uh, the cold wars that are going on in this period over China, for example, between Japan and Germany. Anyway, so that that's the overall background, and I already like talked for like a million hours. So you, as you can see, this is quite interesting. Now, to avoid getting too long with this, because I don't want to like drag this out for like an hour, uh, taking a look at the focus tree. Oh, disclaimer: I've never played the Legation Cities, so I don't know like the mechanics of this stuff uh, and how they work. But essentially, like the diplomatic tree represents this. You can either um, continue the quote unquote open door and um, either have the multipolar mandate or the forum for peace and prosperity. Multipolar mandate is more favoring towards the uh, Anglo-American interests, um, while the peace and prosperity is basically to transform the council into a sort of tripolar thing between Japan, Germany, and America which are obviously the most important powers in China in this timeline. Now, in real life, in um, at this time period in China, there were basically three main powers that were fighting each other. It was Japan, it was the United States of America, and it was the um, British. Now, the Russians and the Germans did have a, did have part of a stake in the Chinese pile, though obviously at this point in history we have the Soviets and not the, uh, the Russians. And the Soviets mostly were doing their good old, like, random, taking bits of China, uh, sp supporting various local factions such as Xinjiang, and, um you know, sort of derping with the Japanese over Manchuria. They weren't really, like, investing in Shanghai or anything like that. Their, their influence was mostly felt in the political and military scene rather than the economic. Um, while the Germans did have the economic, a lot of economic interest in China, but it wasn't nearly as pronounced as it had been uh, in the days of the actual German Empire, of course. Around this period, we have Nazi Germany, uh, and they did have political influence over nationalist China with things like, for example, the military mission, but, you know, uh, they weren't really about to, like, you know, threaten the Japanese position in China or anything like that. So that's basically about it. Um, now, uh, then you have, like, the other two options are the gateway to the east and the western tool. The western tool is basically uh, supporting the Germans, while the gateway to the east is supporting the Japanese. Um, 
And in fact, even if, if you support the Japanese, you even hand over Tianjin up here to uh, Mr. Zhang Zolin. So that's always a great stuff. And oh, like weapon stockpiles, amazing. Supply lines to the world. Uh, compromise neutrality. So we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, say that we're neutral, but we're actually not. And uh, with the Western tool, you can either just be uh, even more German in favor or be more pro League of Eight provinces and uh, let the League of Eight provinces come into your territory. Now, um, it's kind of funny how it's like, oh, we need the, the Southern Jirli soldiers and the legation studies. Um, hilariously enough, in real life, it was actually like the international settlements that were sometimes more stable than the Chinese um, territory surrounding it. And the legation government was better at dealing with certain, you know, public order issues than uh, the various warlords. So like, for example, when uh, in 1927, you have that basically the, the National Revolutionary Army, the, the nationalists are marching towards Shanghai. You have that essentially uh, the labor unions and the communists sponsor a massive revolt that takes over essentially all of Shanghai except for the international settlement area. And so, funnily enough, the International Settlement Police Corps is uh, more effective uh, than the um, Police Corps of Sun Chuan Fang. Um, and later, the soldiers of uh, Jiang Zongchang that were also coming in to Shanghai from the north. 1907 was a very interesting period to live in Shanghai, for sure. Um, so that's essentially that. Which is also the reason why, uh, for example, there were a lot of Chinese that lived in... Uh, the international settlement and in all the concessions. Uh, although, again, it was an apartheid state, so they didn't have any rights. Uh, but, but, and in fact, even like children of British people in like the foreign, ter in like, you know, the overseas territories weren't really as British as the British. Um, which is it was kind of a weird thing, like they couldn't vote for elections back home back then. They'd have to go back to Britain. It was kind of a weird thing. Um, but yeah, basically, uh, what was I think? What was I talking about? Yeah, there was a lot of uh, there were a, a, like a massive amount of Chinese population, and so there there were like also not just lower class Chinese people, but also upper class Chinese people that lived in these places. Uh, so this is represented by the Vermilion Society in uh, in the Kaiser Reich, uh, this is, which is a faction that's essentially a uh, society of either Chinese or quote-unquote Eurasians. Now Eurasians are, as it says here, mixed race uh, people who were quite uh, discriminated against by both societies, unfortunately for them. Uh, this was basically because like in the colonial period, so before like the Nationalist Revolution, before the, the end of the Qing Empire, it was pretty much standard practice for like traders and soldiers of like Western traders and soldiers that were living in China, uh, whether it was in like an actual colonial place or just in a concession or something like that to, you know, um, let's just say take additional female companionship, I believe they refer to it as. They basically, they had, they had Chinese women. Uh, so, there was actually a relatively sizable uh, population of these quote-unquote Eurasians. And, uh, yeah. They often were relatively supportive of, for example, Chinese nationalist movements. And, in fact, like foreign concessions, um, colonies, enclaves, legations and all that were a bit of a freer place for Chinese revolutionaries to operate in than uh, like you know the rest of China both under the uh, Qing and under the warlord regime so funnily enough like for example the first um, the first like section of uh, the first branch of the Chinese Communist Party was in Shanghai in the in the French concession I believe uh, that was also where Chen Duxiao, who is the uh, essentially leader uh, in this timeline of the Chinese Syndicalist Party, in our timeline of the Chinese Communist Party, the first one at least, um, lived in the French concession. So yeah, th th there was this kind of weird symbiotic relationship between uh, the foreign presence in China and, you know, 
China, China. So that's kind of nice. Uh, so other than like merchants, uh, a lot of working class people and a lot of revolutionaries, you also had another sort of weird uh, subgroup of Chinese that was gangsters. Uh, obviously because these places were relatively, um, let's just say free when it came to commerce. Uh, <laughs> like, um, you know, the, the whole reason why the Westerners even came to China in the first place was free trade. Um, so, yeah, uh, in fact, at about this time period, I'm not sure if in the Kaiserreich timeline it's the same, but I am uh, reasonable, like, 75% sure that it's the case. Um, from the, like, l you know, late Qing Empire onwards, essentially from the 1870s onwards, the Chinese customs um, were actually controlled by foreigners. Uh, there was a pretty famous and important person called Robert Hart, who... Um, Famously, basically resigned from his like British government post. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what post he had, uh, but he essentially he uh, he became the head of the Chinese customs collection and duties collection. So essentially, um, like there were a bunch of foreigners serving the successive Chinese governments, uh, most of the time, pretty honestly doing the interest of the Chinese government, sometimes just, you know, doing favors for their friends and themselves. So it's not that weird that commerce is controlled by foreigners. Um, even if, like, you know, there were a lot of Chinese businessmen, uh, obviously the foreign commerce was quite important at this time in China. And gangsters and, you know, various um, secret societies were a part of the society in the coastal uh, realm of uh, China at this time. Obviously, most famous one is the Green Gang. I'm not sure if uh, this is represented. Oh yeah, it is represented. Du Yuesheng over here. The interior minister, quote unquote interior minister. Uh, this guy was the leader of um, essentially the most famous uh, triad or heaven and earth society or mafia group called the Green Gang. Uh, who was famously, I like how he's a social liberal, famously he was pretty friendly with Chiang Kai-shek and helped to put down that communist uh, slash trade unionist revolt that I talked about earlier. Um, which um, made him and Chiang Kai-shek pretty, uh, pretty, you know, uh, on pretty good terms with the foreign powers. Anyway, um, so yeah, we, we have that and for example Jiang Xiaoling and Huang Jinrong were also other gangsters. I'm not sure, I like how he's a crime fighter. Um, pretty sure that's an euphemism. Uh, Chinese love their euphemisms quite a bit. Um, and he <laughs> even secret police chief, amazing. Terror in the night, definitely more fitting. So that's basically that. Um, these places had, like these secret societies had quite an important place in the in the society and the concessions. And of course, uh, you know, this is quite uh, you know, important in Kaiserreich as well. It's represented also in the fact that like essentially all the factions are um, various trade groups, essentially like the American Chamber of Commerce and the International Mandate, uh, which is the leading group at the beginning. Then there's the Hong Kong Club. Oh, oh lovely. Uh, don't you, when do you want to like have dinner with the Hong Kong Club? Certainly a bunch of very, very uh, wholesome fellas. Then you have obviously the Shanghai Municipal Council. Uh, lovely little place, you know, in Shanghai, uh, directing essentially the business of the international settlement. Then there's the Ostchina Direktorium, which is the AOG, you know, the, the German East Asia. And then there's the China Agency. La la, I love the China Agency. Now, it's hilarious because it says, uh, in reality, it represents not just the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Japanese consulate, but also the War Ministry. This makes it a highly fractional organization that can be difficult to pin down. The full extent of this operation may never be known. Now, uh, hilariously enough, uh, basically the Japanese civilian government, so again, uh, the foreign office of, the, of the, the Japanese government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the military in Japan had separate organs to a, sort of uh, project power abroad. And in fact, even within the military, the army, the navy, and the secret police, the Kempeitai, all had different 
organizations and different agents all over the place. In fact, in Manchuria, this is quite hilarious. You should, you really, really should read about like interwar Manchuria in real life because this was just ridiculous. Um, and often these, uh, conf like these different Japanese groups would like fight each other. <laughs> Maybe not like with, uh, you know, guns or whatever, but they, they did like struggle against each other. Anyway, it's, this is kind of a nice little nod to that. Uh, now, the Japanese do have a bit of an interesting history in Shanghai. Um, it's a thing that's not really well known, but in 1942, the Japanese actually invaded Shanghai, like with a full-scale naval invasion with ships bombarding the city. You know, this is even before the Sino-Japanese War. This is before the Mukden incident, uh, before they took over. Actually, no, I believe it's slightly after the Mukden incident, right? I I did the derps. Um, and uh, essentially, they used the they used the an incident in the uh, Japanese part of Shanghai, which wasn't like Japanese territory, but there was a, a part in Shanghai that had essentially a lot of Japanese residents, but also like a lot of Japanese factories. Uh, that was north of the uh, north of the main river in Shanghai, which is the Huangpu. Um, that had a let me pull up the map that had essentially a ton of Japanese people in it. Here we are. It's, uh, oh, no, don't want to do that. It's essentially this one that you're looking at right now. This is the Huangpu River. Up north over here, here's the northern boundary of the International Settlement. And uh, up here, essentially, there's this quarter called Jabe. Um, and then there was another one called Hongqiu or Hong. I've only read it in Wei Jiao's, which is retarded, and so I don't know how to read it. Uh, and then there was also a, another part down here. Now, basically, this strip was very, very heavily inhabited by Japanese people, and uh, something like the 80% of foreigners living in Shanghai were Japanese people. So uh, the Japanese actually used an incident in uh, this part of the city as a pretext to invade the whole fucking city. So. The Japanese have an interesting uh, history when it comes to this uh, uh, this sort of uh, country, you know. Um, yeah, that's that's just the Japanese. Anyway, um, so at the end, you either remove the Japanese influence from the council or remove the German influence from the council or occupy the neutral zone, um, which uh, I'm pretty sure is just supposed to be like a region between... Um, like a region within like Shanghai and Tianjin or whatever that is supposed to be Chinese, but it's actually uh, administered by the international mandate, the international legation cities. I don't know, uh, not entirely sure. Uh, this is again because like the boundaries for these international concession settlements, weird, semi real countries. Um, that weren't recognized and then supposed to be existing were very, very vague, right? And they often, like, wanted to grow these settlements without really um, the consent of the Chinese government. In fact, there were a few... Let's see if there is a reference to that. There were a few... Uh, like a Tianjin Railway Hub. Now nah, here it talks mostly about railways. Yeah, unfortunate. There were a few attempts, like for example, using roads, like for example, um, like building a road outside of the international settlement with international settlement funds, and then declaring that road to be international settlement territory, which obviously then expands into everything that gets built, you know, um, on either side of that road becomes a corridor of international settlement territory. They had all these kinds of weird tricks. Anyway, uh, so then you either choose the stable markets or they made or, uh, the war industries. So, um, why? Because the this is necessary to prevent a financial meltdown in case of war, because the economy over here is fucked up. Uh, now, there's a currency reserve system. The currency reserve system is there because, essentially, now, China was weird at this point. In fact, it was always pretty weird when it came to currencies uh, because it just had like a ton of different denominations in circulation. Every place 
uh, every province, every sometimes even smaller places had their own um, currency that was being minted sort of separately from all the others. It was a mess. Uh, the Qing at the end of the empire did try to introduce a standard currency for all of China, uh, the Yuan, uh, but it didn't really work out all that well. Uh, the only real like common denominator was the fact that silver was the standard and so you had a bunch of foreign coins uh, that were silver coins that were circulating that were basically like you know just being accepted because you know as long as it's silver it's fine um, especially the the Mexican dollars because uh, there's a ton of silver mines uh, in Mexico and also there were silver mines in the Spanish colonies in South America so when these start to circulate uh, essentially Mexican silver dollars are pretty prominent but also American silver dollars Japanese yen all that kind of stuff so uh, the currency reserve is quite important because in this sort of messy currency environment if currency reserves fall low then shit gets really, really bad because nobody really, really knows how to deal with it. Because even though there's like a mint in Shanghai, there's probably like a different one all over the place. And so nobody fucking knows what's going on. And so nobody really knows what money is like worth anything now. And then the value of money skyrockets for some money. And then the value of money just, you know, takes a nosedive for other kinds of money. So poor people get very, very poor and rich people get very, very rich. Um, which is a pretty recurring problem in uh, China pretty much until like 1949. Uh, but even more explosive in a, again, like fluid currency environment, let's just call it as uh, this international uh, um, melting pot. So you can also take loans from the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank uh, and the Deutsche Asiatische Bank or the DAB. Yeah, I'm doing the DAB right now because I'm a cringe guy. You can also buy certain companies because that's really, really cool. Um, you can purchase places, which is quite awesome. Uh, pur purchase places. You can purchase uh, weapons, which is quite awesome. You can investigate uh, gangsters. There's influence. Now, um, What's really, really cool is that there's a reference to a few nice things that were, uh, let's just say, legation culture. Uh, for example, the Jardine Mason and Company was pretty much the most important, uh, for, for a long time, the most important British corporation operating in China. And uh, it was a drug cult. <laughs> it was a drug cartel, essentially. Uh, but, you know, later it, quote unquote, uh, went... Um, it went good, quote unquote, or whatever. It's uh, still active today. It's like one of. It's definitely in Fortune 500. It's just called Jardine, not Jardine and Mason. But, you know. Um, yeah, drug dealers. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah, they, these, were the, these were the guys that were bringing in the opium. Uh, the, you know, uh, it's pretty famous for the opium war and all that. Anyway, there's also the opening Vladivostok. Uh, it's kind of a nice little reference that essentially when um, when a ship turned up to a port being like let us trade or else boom 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 it was called opening the port so it's kind of a nice little nod uh, loan from the Russo Asiatic Bank <laughs> is the Russo Asiatic Bank in any way shape or form <laughs> like able to hand out loans I have no idea loan from Yokohama Bank so, you know, lovely Japan doing their part. And um, what's lovely is that then you will get to either do the Greater Shanghai Plan or the String of Pearls. Uh, now, the Greater Shanghai Plan is to make Shanghai great. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of uh, pretty correct because like Shanghai was pretty fucking important to China at this period but I've talked about that pretty extensively and I will talk about that um, again very very soon or very very in, much in the future so I don't know let's not even talk about Shanghai um, what's pretty cool oh speculation and yeah the land speculation now land speculation was pretty important in the legation cities but we don't have time or in the international settlement but we don't have time to talk about that essentially land in uh, in the international settlement was very valuable and so there was a lot of uh, weird fuckery going on with land value in there but you know 
no time to talk about that right now. Uh, the String of Pearls is just trying to develop essentially all the different, um, all the different ports. Uh, it's a reference to a real life thing, um, but it it's got no really. It's just literally name dropping. It's got no relations to the real life String of Pearls. The real life String, String of Pearls is this Chinese uh, plan to sort of. Um, surround India and gain access to the Suez Canal without really um, without really being blocked by Japan, the United States or India. Basically uh, getting a whole bunch of friendly uh, countries friendly to China along uh, this route essentially. So you know Sri Lanka, Maldives, Singapore, um, Taiwan of course, uh, Indonesia, and um, Pakistan, but it's a weird thing, and also some East African ports get, you know, uh, get brought up to that. Uh, but it's just a name drop; it doesn't have any uh, reference. Anyway, there's the minor cities, uh, Tianjin Railway Hub, which is a real thing. It's pretty important. Um, Bypass the AOG, sure. And you introduce the legation dollar. Really no. <laughs> I'm sure that's gonna work because that's a Oh I know that coin. I've I've got a I've got an I've got like a JPG I think of that coin somewhere. Well, good to know that the, the good boys at Kaiserreich have already done the work of cutting it up for me. Um <laughs> so I can steal it for my own graphics. Sorry. Uh if you want credit, ask for it and I will give it. Um, and then the universities of China or whatever. Uh, yeah, so that's basically about it. Then there's a nice little uh, military tree, which is more about like expanding the, either expanding the volunteer force, which was a, okay, we don't have time to talk about this, but it's a, um, it's an interesting uh, phenomenon, this volunteer force, because it's essentially, um, gathered together all the foreign people that were living in um, in all the essentially concessions um, and it was really really weird because the Shanghai one was obviously the most developed and the Shanghai one even had like for example a white Russian uh, regiment in the 30s it had a Jewish regiment it had a swedish one a german one the german one is an interesting story because it disbanded in i think 1914 and the reason it disbanded in 1914 obviously you you may realize you may recognize the date right um so obviously they they didn't want to you know start shooting at the british regiment and they, they had no intention to the the foreigners in in, in in china that were living in china were pretty um pretty loyal to each other but obviously there was a war going on in China at that moment as well because the Japanese were invading Qingdao and so uh, the volunteer um, the volunteer corps German unit which was civilians joined the German military marine garrison in Shanghai to reinforce Qingdao, which of course in the end didn't work out because the Japanese took it over anyway but you know it's kind of an interesting story um, so yeah, this this was a real army. Like, you, you can see footage of, like, parades. They loved parades, which is why there's this pomp and circumstance thing. Uh, and they loved musical bands, um, as well. And, um, yeah, essentially, they just really, uh, didn't want to talk about the fact that they were an army, so they called it the Volunteer Force, but it, in all effect, it was an army. Uh, some units of the Volunteer Corps were actually standing, while the vast majority were just like random civilians who, you know, in case the yellow people were up to something dangerous, would be drafted. Uh, or you can establish a Chinese division. Now, in real life, this never would have happened. Absolutely, n these motherfuckers were a race. Like, you, you, think, you think niggas were racist back then? Yes, they were. Um, <laughs> and, um... But obviously, in the in the Kaiserreich timeline, the, the legation cities quite a bit expanded from just the random Shanghai, you know, international settlement. So yeah, that's about it. Is there anything else really to talk about? I'm probably missing something. I am 100% missing something quite important to talk about. Hmm. 
<laughs> well, no. I think that's... Uh... Yeah. Surprisingly, I think that's about it. Okay, I'm... A good 95% sure that I missed something. Um, if you know what I'm missing, tell me. Uh, I'm sure some of you fucking know what I'm missing. Anyway, uh, that's gonna be about it for the uh, legation cities. So yeah, very, very interesting place. Pretty good overall. I'm, I'm not sure like it would be a... Um, great campaign to actually play. I'm sure I'm gonna get to play it at some point. Um, oh, right, there's this, like, crime people. Um, there were a ton of, like, uh, soldiers that would be posted in random places in China to, uh, quote-unquote, guard uh, the concessions and the uh, and the settlements, and they would desert and become, like, criminals and mercenaries and shit. It was fucking hilarious. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I'm, like, it's great for flavor, it's a great place for flavor, but I'm not sure it would be a like, great campaign, because it's not like you can really do too much. I don't know. Um, like, in Hearts of Iron 4 terms. Like, uh, if this was something like TNO or, you know, a glorious, um, a glorious, like, uh, Crisis in the Kremlin-like game, or I suppose Crisis in the, in the Municipal Council, I feel like it would be very, very interesting, but, you know, in Hoi 4, you don't really play it for, like, the... the you know, sometimes you do play for the nation building, but, you know, sometimes you want to, you know, boom, boom, shoot, shoot. Anyway, um, that's going to be a uh, topic uh, to think about in the future, whether or not I play the legations of these. So anyway, I want to thank you all for watching, hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you soon.